Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So, kind of a good news, bad news situation here, I guess. The uh, good news is we are just trucking through 4th edition. Bad news is that uh, partially because just nothing is really speaking to me here. Um, and I'm gonna go into that. Let's finish up the, uh, the Abyssal Plague crossover. So... I started reading Oath of Vigilance by James Wyatt, and I, I just got this feeling like, oh my god, like this is not world-spanning, this is not some giant thing that's going on, this just isn't exciting at all, and I looked at the uh, description of book three because I'm like, is this seriously all, this entire trilogy just building up to the goddamn Fallcrest invasion? And it looks like the Fallcrest invasion happens at the end of book two, but it looks like book three is just Al Bannon is infected now, possibly with the Void Harrow, and I'm assuming that's how they figure out how to get rid of it. But it just, it wasn't like adventurous, you know, spanning through the worlds and yada, yada, yada. And I, I think I tried this out after I tried Sword of the Gods, and I saw how little that this crossover had to do with that at all. And so I started reading it, and I was just like, God, I don't care about these characters. I don't care what happens with this. You know, it, it just it doesn't feel like Thar's Dune is going to be some, like, mover and shaker amongst the gods or anything. So what do I care? So I skipped that. I looked at The Chain God. It just looked terrible. It's one of those cheap books. Have you seen the newer Realms books? I, I think for the Sundering, they didn't do this, and I think post-Sundering, they didn't do this either which the only ones that I've looked at those are Aaron Evans's, but it's one of those, like, if you pick it up, it, it, it's just flimsy. Like, it just feels different than a normal paperback book, which is a little strange. Whatever. It doesn't really bother me. I actually kind of like them in a weird way. Like, they make it feel disposable and pop culture-y, which I like. Probably not to most people's tastes. Uh, so I'm skipping Chain God, because I just, I don't care. And, you know, it wasn't Realms to begin with, so whatever. Under Crimson Sun, I haven't read yet. I'll probably go through and read the new Dark Sun stuff at some point. I did the, whatever it's called, Under the City, Under the Sand or something, and I enjoyed that overall. So, um, y you know, Dark Sun moving to 4th edition, not really a huge change, except for the fact that Primordials existed in the world now or whatever, and that's odd, because it was intended to be an atheist world, and... They never really fit, and yada, yada, yada. I mean, it's like with a bear crashing into Toriel, it, there's this feeling that all the 4th edition stuff almost kind of works. I don't know. It just, man. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, the thing to note about Under a Crimson Sun, however, is that the back of the book uh, it mentions the Chanid god. I'll, I'll try to get a picture of that and share it in this as well. I think it's when I saw the Chanid God on the back of the book, this major typo on, you know, the one paragraph that they have to sell the book with, that I realized, oh, <laughs> they don't give a shit about the fiction line anymore. Like, that was the point where it really hit home to me that, oh man, this is a sinking ship. So let's see. Sword of the Gods by Bruce R. Cordell. So the answer to what happened to Damascus between Gates of Madness and here is somehow he became a diva? Deva? I don't know how you say that. And this book was very frustrating to me because if I tried to describe it to someone, and I'll try to describe it to you, dear listener, an amnesiac wakes up and keeps ha and is in the middle of a demon summoning ceremony, uh, gone wrong, and keeps having flashes to being a darker, more murderous version of himself than he feels comfortable with completely. And he begins piecing his ex-life back together. This is, I don't know, it's its kind of, uh, I got a lot of shades of uh, Planescape Torment out of it. But, like, for instance, uh, there's a movie, Amateur, by Hal Hartley, who I love. And that movie tackled really close to the same subject matter in a way that I loved. Yet, for some reason, this book just never came together for me, I guess. Damascus always seemed right on the verge of being a character who I would really like, but it never really took home. And there were just so many kind of side 
quests thrown at us, and it, it, it just never congealed for me. Like, I kept reading it thinking that at some point Damascus' memory would kick in and it would just be awesome, you know? Like, there would be this kind of awakening or whatever, and I would, I would feel really excited about it after that. And it, that just never really happens. It's kind of a lackluster murder mystery with, like, maybe three scenes. It really feels like they're like, hey, this is how you use 4th edition miniatures to set up this scene. It, it felt so close to being a book that I would really enjoy, and it just never got there. And I was kind of sad about that. I ended up skimming through the end of it because I was just like, ah, whatever. I mean, it's just, it, there's no way that it's going to accomplish anything that I care about in the time remaining. Uh, there, there were some things that I thought was interesting, like there was kind of a chubby shopkeeper who was one of our main party members, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, you don't see that that much. But then through the book, it's hinted that his chubbiness is a uh, some sort of glamour that he has on him, and that he's actually svelte hiding underneath it for whatever reason. No answer is given to that. It's just left as a mystery, and if I cared enough, maybe that's answered in the sequel, Spinner of Lies, but I just didn't care enough, and Spinner of Lies ties into Rise of the Underdark, which I've already read a couple that were Rise of the Underdark, and let me tell you, there's really no, I mean, like, drow or in it, and that's about it. Uh, Rise of the Underdark was another go-nowhere, mean-nothing crossover that they did, and I guess I don't necessarily feel like the crossovers have to mean something, but it's also kind of like, why bother, really? So yeah, so I'm, I'm skipping Spinner of Lies because I just, I, I don't see the reason to bother, you know? I mean, it's like, the book was meh, and I'm pretty sure it's another Kindle-only edition, so to get it, I would have to buy it, and I just don't feel a enough interest to buy it. On a similar note, Shadowbane. I started Shadowbane and I was like, all right, what genre are we going to go into next with Eric Scott to be? This one's hardcore western, kind of sort of uh, Escape from New York as well, which is cool. That's come up twice now. Um, Shadowbane goes to Luskin, um, and uh, Luskin is under quarantine or whatever, and it's like nothing but warring factions now. And I'm, I'm sure there must be a specific western that he's going for here that I just am not familiar enough with the genre to notice. There's something about 4th edition, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something about it that feels off to me, that feels as if they're trying very hard to make their own patois, but they're doing it in a way that doesn't work for me. Like, both Sword of the Gods and Shadowbane use this idea of, like, wait here about a song. And it's like, okay, so I guess three and a half minutes? But during these, you know, this, like, medieval times when, like, bards sing, like, literally he has a bard in Shadowbane singing the tale of, oh, hell, what was the Ghostwalker, the Ghostwalker, the book that he wrote. And it's like a, a song in their time is like an hour, three hours long. Like, is somebody really just like, hey, wait here three hours. At that point, don't you think they would say three bells or something like that? They keep trying to do these little things, and oh my god, Shadowbane and the cursing. I haven't mentioned <laughs> with the cursing, you know, Paul Kemp was allowed to use shit like once per book or whatever, and now it is just all over the place. There's usually one character per book, like in uh, Sword of the Gods, there's a female thief, and it's like, Every other word out of her mouth is like, oh shit, shit, that's crazy. Hey, shit, and it just, it's like, it feels ridiculous because it's so overused. Like, I have no problem with cursing in my fantasy books, but I find it so funny that it just feels as if the authors are now like, we can say shit, guys, we can really say shit. <laughs> like, it, it seems so unmotivated most of the time, especially when in, like, say, Shadowbane, you have all these crazy curses. The only one that I remember is Hrasting, which isn't even easy to say. Like, it just doesn't... Uh, um, so, with Shadowbane especially, I just felt like all the patois was going crazy. There were certain scenes that I was reading where I was like, I don't know what is actually happening or who is in, even involved here. I don't know. I felt like 
we got dropped into the middle of things and I was just supposed to know from maybe background books or something what was going on, but I felt really lost and really like, like again, it was like the, there was this plot that seemed straightforward and simple. Basically, it's like I'm going into this town to rescue this one person who means a lot to me and if anybody has hurt her, I'm going to kill every last person here. A little unforgiven overtones there as well. But I couldn't follow it. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I did not make it very far at all, and I've just decided to hell with it. I guess I just have to accept that as much as I like his ambitions and his goals, it seems, and him as a person, he, he seems very interested in things like intersectional feminism and so on and so forth, and Eric is very, very vocal on the uh, the message boards and everything. So he seems like a really cool guy. But I, I just, I don't think I like him as a writer. Uh, so, hey, you know, art is subjective, right? So yeah, Shadowbane just did not at all work for me. Uh, also, <laughs> that means we'll be skipping Shadowbane Eye of Justice. Because, I mean, I've given this series two books and I've given Eric like five books. I, I did honestly like Ghostwalker overall. It's weird that even though I felt like it felt like a first novel, it's still the one that I liked overall out of all of Debbie's stuff. So yeah, just a lot of skipping and not being excited about stuff here, and I'm sorry about that. So, as an added bonus, I am going to end out with a positive note. I don't know if you remember, but way back in episode, like, three or something, I talked about how I was skipping Council of Blades because I couldn't find a copy of it. Well, in the interim, I have read some Paul Kidd books. Uh, I read... I, I went through because I really liked the Greyhawk adventure books that I had read, and I hadn't read his, and so I went through and I read, I think the first one is White Plume Mountain, and then I read the sequel, Descent into the Un uh, Descent into the Depths, and the third one is Queen of the Demon Wed Pits, and I haven't read that one yet, but I loved the first two, and so I was like, well, what the hell, now that everything's available on Kindle, I'm going to grab it, and I went ahead and paid the three or four extra dollars and got it on an audiobook, Two things. One, the narrator on this one is really, really good. Like, he is a really good narrator and perfectly suited to this tale. I think he would be really good for the Aaron Evans books as well, because he can do comedy. Council of Blades is, it feels to me, like much of kids' stuff, like he's writing a cartoon. And not a kind of D&D &D morning cartoon like I've said uh, Salvatore stuff reminds me of before but more like a kind of a Disney cartoon. Uh, I wouldn't quite say Pixar, maybe, but but like a, this feels like late 80s, early 90s sort of Disney adventure. We have a wacky inventor-slash-artist character who is kind of sort of falling for this princess who wants to be a sorceress, and she's very slight and has giant owlish glasses and a cruel stepmother... The way that he describes the stepmother is friggin' hilarious. It's always like she draws in breath and the the uh, uh, the mighty um, strings on her bustier um, nearly gave out but held on once more. You know, it's it just the, the way that he describes it is so funny and such great imagery. And in my mind, I saw them kind of stuttering and moving around as animated characters. There's also a uh, flame bird, I think, Tekariikiki, and uh, th that bird plays in heavily to the plot, which is, you know, I, I mean, the princess character has an animal companion. I mean, it feels like such a Disney movie. And there's this other big plot with, like, the the blade cities moving against each other and in the end of course our characters get embroiled in the war and everything um and act three was a little dull simply because it's like well i know exactly where this is going and what's going to happen but still there were just some really good moments and some clever ways to kind of work with magic and someone who wants to be an inventor in a world of magic and yada 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 so if you have not checked out council of blades I really highly recommend it, and so I'm glad that we patched that hole. <laughs> now that we're 250 
years into the future from that. Uh, speaking of the timeline, I found a, uh, a different timeline online rather than Olov like we'd been using. I think it's all timelines. I'll try to, uh, I'll try to link to it in the information, but they actually have uh, the 4th edition stuff timed out, and I mean, it's, you know, it's as good as anything, right? Uh, as good as my complete guesses, um, so I think next time we're going to look at Cry of the Ghost Wolf, because apparently that happened before everything else, 4th edition, um, you know, like before, like, like it was 1474 or something like that, and I'm assuming if you look close enough and you know enough about Every, everything, you know, like, I'm I'm just not, like, I, I can't contain all of that stuff. For me, it's just the things that stand out to me, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, and, and I'm sure there are things that are mentioned that would make it placeable in time. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. I don't know, something else. Maybe we'll do Avenger. Maybe we'll try to end off a couple of trilogies that have just been sitting out there forever at this point. Anyway, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Realms Remembered.